the chapter objectives as per usual. Um, so what's your physical examination for? This is important to you. Okay? It's important for you to know why you do what you do in your state. Right? Uh, physical examinations are for several purposes, but the main one is for baseline data. Where are you normally? This is the whole purpose behind annual physical. Right? So we can see if anything is trending off of your baseline. Uh, assessments are also <clears throat> uh, used for any kind of significant change. If something um, drastic has changed, we watch for trends and things like that. But to see if the therapeutic things that we're doing is working. How do we know it's working if we don't assess it? Yeah, we don't. Well, you won't. You won't know uh, without assessing. So the purpose of completing a physical exam are listed right there on your slide. Want to evaluate outcomes of care as part of your nursing process. Remember cultural sensitivity when it comes to your assessment. Some people are not going to look you in the eyes. Some people are not going to want you to touch them if you're the opposite sex, right? Mm -hmm. All these cultural things. Some women don't uncover themselves in front of people. They don't. See, all these cultural things are important to us. Cultural sensitivity when we do. Uh, the data that we collect during the physical examination is used for a whole lot of different stuff. Your assessment, listen to me. You want to know how important it is? It's the basis of all the care they receive, not just from you, but the doctors. How I many of you realize and understand that doctors make decisions based off nurses' assessments every day? You are their eyes and ears. So if you halfway do this, they get a halfway assessment. They can either over medicate or under medicate clients. Doesn't matter who's legally responsible. Right? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go Saturday Pop on Sunday. That's twice. I did that so much. Got to put your sign out, let them know it's Monday. Cultural sensitivity, like I said, very important. Respect the cultural differences. Uh, be mindful, not to stereotype. Let's just say um, you got a 16 year old girl, maybe you're working in ED, emergency department, ER, emergency room. 16 year old girl shows up um, and <clears throat> she's having uh, abdominal pain, lower abdominal pain. Um, she does not want her parents to be in on the uh, assessment portion. She's shown up to the ER herself, not interested in having anybody legally uh, responsible for her to be in on the interaction between you and her. She expresses this discomfort. Uh, has been going on for about a week now. Um, she is sexually active currently with multiple partners. What do you think is wrong with her? She's pregnant. So she got an STD. Or STD. It could be PCOS. Or she could be a lady. Or people throw that dead label. I mean, what? She don't put her in a lady. She don't jump all the way. I mean. The little bitty baby bump. So, um, you just made a decision based off of what? Stereotypical bias. Do you feel guilty about it? You should. Right? This is the thing I want to learn to do as a nurse. It's okay to think those things. It's not okay to say those things. Okay? It's called critically thinking. You should not feel guilty for thinking that she might have been pregnant, nor she had an STI, nor did she have PCOS, you know, nor was it her cycle, nor does she have, you know, a uh, cyst on her ovary. You should not feel guilty for drawing the conclusion that you did. But you just got to watch. When I was a little girl, my mama taught us a song, and I had to sing it to myself very often. And just, oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Like, you have to be mindful because it shuts down rapport. Right? Be, that's clinical judgment. That's critical thinking. As long as it don't come with a neck pop and a lip smack, like, it's probably not biased. You're just trying to glean information. Remember I told you uh, last week in lecture that society tells you um, that judging people or evaluating people is inappropriate, but it's what we do in nursing. Um, a lot of times society will level you to extracise you, ostracize you. Nursing, we label you, stereotype you so we can pull you in and make you work. It's the why. I remember Ms. Benton talking to you about your why. 
And there's some, it's the lie. So don't feel guilty because you said she was pregnant. Now, Daniel, we got, she's already been playing with things now. <laughs> what made you think that she was pregnant? Just the symptoms. The symptoms, that abdominal discomfort for a couple weeks. What else? For someone that you hung to, um, to, to want to go to the hospital for a dog, you know, it had to be something out of the ordinary. So, Mr. Taylor thinks because she was 16 and had a stomachache and wanted to go to the ER, she might be pregnant. Not wanting her parents in the room. What else? I gave you a piece of evidence based on sex. She said she had multiple partners. Like, that was a red flag for me. You don't want your mom in the room. I remember being 16. <laughs> yeah, right? So that part really didn't throw me with some multiple partners. Long story short, I don't know what happened to the girl because it was a made up story. She got all better, just a man box. <laughs> so, whatever you prepare for the examination, preparing for the examination, this is where your infection control is going to matter, right? Wash your hands, germs are everywhere. Right. Wear gloves anytime you're going to come in contact with any kind of bodily fluid. You got some tables here, um, table 31 right there, medical equipment. You don't miss the stuff. You don't have to memorize that. But there's some household items. <clears throat> These things contain latex. Latex allergies are dangerous. Anybody know what kind of allergy kind of goes hand in hand with latex? Bananas. Yeah, a lot of times people who are allergic to bananas are also allergic to latex. So one of the things that you'll start doing on your on your procedures for checkoffs is, hey, my name's Felicia. will be your student nurse today. Can you state your name, date of birth? Tiffany Chair, January 1st, 1990. Provide us some privacy. Wash my hands. Put us on clean gloves. So, uh, Ms. Travis, today I'm here to insert a Foley catheter. Your physician ordered for you to have placed. It's going to drain urine from your bladder. Um, we, whenever we did the bladder scan, you had 800 milliliters of urine in there, and that's why you're experiencing bladder distension. It's causing you to be uncomfortable. Have you ever had one placed before? No. No? You got any questions about it? No. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to expose your uh, perineal area, your genitals, and uh, be in your private space. I'm going to talk you through all that stuff. But before I start, are you allergic to latex or beta dye? No. She says no. You're going to start assessing allergies. Why? Because people die from anaphylactic shock, simple answer. Right? Not just that, but uh, allergies cause swelling and all the things, and you know, we just kind of don't want that. So let's say how you this important to you. A little list right there. We just want to assess <clears throat> allergies. All right. Back to our infection control. There are patients who have open skin lesions, infected wounds, and other communicable diseases. You are going to encounter this. Standard precautions. You know what that is? Just gloves. Okay? Just gloves. And those uh, precautions are going to step up a little bit as we go. I'm not going to dig into that too deep today. <clears throat> and hygiene policies. Very important to you. Wash your hands. You know how long? 20 seconds. Yeah. This is around 30 seconds. Right? Happy birthday. Yeah. Please don't sing the Longhorn Happy Birthday song. Does anybody else wonder why Longhorn's Happy Birthday song has a hot dog at the end of it? This is a steakhouse. <laughs> you could have said T bone, filet mignon, like anything, and you said hot dog. Anyway, huh? The Longhorn, anybody know it? Mm mm. I've never heard it. So, I know. I've heard it. I just you know don't what? know the vibe. I was actually wanting to, I, I would have to lock the weekend. It's weekend thing, so here's that thing. Fried chicken, country hawk. It's your birthday. Hot dog. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get it. Yeah, they do it. <laughs> And they just come out of nowhere and give everybody a panic attack. <laughs> so you have a birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. You don't get any extra credit for that. <laughs> we needed well, the ship in the room, right? We needed the ship in the room. Washing your hands, very important. I, the whole happy birthday thing, because that's what they taught us in nursing school. So you put your soap on your hands, you wet your hands, you need another order, right? You wet your hands, put soap on your hands, and the whole time you're lathering. 
Happy birthday, you. Whatever your favorite song is, as long as it's clean. Right? For about 30 seconds. But I say if you'll sing the happy birthday song all the way through, and you got a good, good scrub. You won't pay attention to washing between your fingers. Right? There's nail beds in the palms of your hands. Wash your thumbs all the way down to your wrists. Okay? Important to you. Hand hygiene is important. You wash your hands when you're entering into a room, and you wash your hands when you're leaving a room. Now we have this fancy, fancy stuff that everybody knows about, but we can't have a mental health because people will drink it. Yes, hand sanitizer. Right? And you shh, shh, in and shh, out. Listen to me. It doesn't work for C. diff. It does not. Like C. diff bacteria is like, that's how you get <laughs> Not a day. <laughs> Never my whole different side of the bacteria world. C. diff will only be eliminated through hand washing with soap and water. You always need to remember that you're going to see it in the future. I know at least once or twice or sometimes a bunch. Right. <clears throat> Infection control is important. Latex allergies, we ask the questions, like I said. Now, the hard thing is, is people who are non-responsive are not good historians, right? Mm -hmm. When you see a list in somebody's chart that they're not a good historian, that means they could not speak for themselves well enough to make it clear. Do you think we just err on the side of caution with those folks? Yes. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much, because if you've ever seen a latex allergy, you get pretty nasty. Okay. So table thirty point one is a what we'll call a short list. <laughs> so we got non-latex substitutes and latex products. Environment. What do you think needs to be happening in this environment where you're going to assess this patient here? Privacy and respect. Yeah, so privacy first, because you'll get failed for checkoffs. You know, shut the curtain. <laughs> Reckon you might want some light on. You can see well, right? Not a lot of distraction and noise. So you might have to ask them, can we mute Lonesome Dove for just a minute? So I can listen to your heart and your lungs and your uh, GI sounds. Like, can, can we make a Right? We don't want to hear that. So the environment is going to... Um, is going to yield you good results when it is set appropriately. Now make sure they're comfortable, right? Uh, Y'all yeah, know those comfortable. I don't know who made the tables in the doctor's offices, but they didn't think about comfort mm -hmm. at all. But try to make sure they're as comfortable as they can be. Uh, privacy is the biggest part about this. Want to be able to easily access their entire body for this experience, okay? Their entire body. Wash your hands, wash your hands. So when you see things that say, what is the most um, effective form of infection control? And hand washing. Right? Hand hygiene. Hand hygiene. Hand hygiene. You're just going to see it big on. We learned a couple years ago that people had been washing their hands for a long time. It made me kind of nervous. <laughs> So ensure that you clean equipment before every encounter. We talked already about your stethoscope, remember? You want to clean the bell and the diaphragm between every patient. You don't want to take my uh, CD up over there to Ms. McIntyre's room. She will not be grateful. Okay, wipe everything off um, that touches anyone else. Keep our uh, equipment clean. Proper physical exam will take into consideration cultural aspects. Like I said, always remember that. Um, there's a smooth examination feature called head to toe assessment. One of the things that y'all are going to ask me, because y'all already started this mess, can I go out of order? So for vital signs, I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. As long as you remember them all and you guys did great head to toe, the answer is no. Okay? Mm -hmm. When I give you the checkoff list at demo Thursday morning at 9 o'clock, Right? That's the order you're going to go in. Trust me when I tell you that you're going to want to stick to it. It is a comprehensive assessment. Okay? And some of y'all are going to want to willy-nilly, but this is what happens. Y'all get down here to the shoulder, and all of a sudden you want me to squeeze your hands, but then you forgot about my range of motion. Like, you've got to follow the sheet, right? Yeah, if you start with my scalp, make sure I don't have lumps, last lesions, and bruises in my head, and then you tell me to lift my eyebrows and all that stuff so you can make sure my cranial nerves are good and smile at you. Like, it has a flow to it. That flow is there for a reason. Don't book a system. Learn it in order at which you're taught. It'll be better. 
A disorganized approach is going to make you have some inconsistent findings. Safety is huge. Listen, don't leave people who are confused by themselves. People who have a tendency to fall over when you set them up. Right? One of the things you're going to assess whenever you're doing head and toe assessment is gait. You know what that is? It's the way people walk. Right? Somebody showed us what was that called? Spank walk. It wasn't. The spank walk. Was it Miss Mouse? Hey, it was. But she said it. I see your eyes. I'm struggling with all you. You ain't getting no coffee on your two hour lunch? Uh, I wouldn't be in you if I don't have that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got some grease in there. <laughs> Very not offered. We won't talk about the noise they make when you walk until you walk out the room, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, gait is important, but what's important before I assess gait? Are they safe to stand? And you know what? I can look at Ms. Travis and say, hey, Ms. Travis, you have any issues standing and walking? No. Uh-uh, sure don't. All right, we're going to stand up. Bloop, <laughs> right? <You> kinda... <laughs> so, a really good time to assess gait in the real world is when they're walking in. Okay, um, but once they're in the room with you, if you come in the room after, you know, they sat them in there three days ago and they've been waiting for somebody to come and assess them and finally, after three days, you come in the room and you want to assess them, just ask them to stand up and walk away from you and tell them, okay, turn and walk back to me. But we also want to make sure they don't have vertigo issues, right? Safety, huge. Infection control safety is huge when it comes to this. Right. Keep it in order. Organization assess each body system during the physical examination when the patient is admitted to the hospital. We perform a complete examination at the time of admission at least once a day, often once per shift, sometimes once per hour. It really depends on how many of y'all want to be ICU nurses. I don't think I'm going to see any hands. Yeah, just one. Do you, Ms. Wynn? I thought you wanted to do aesthetics. Oh, but she wants two jobs. Okay. Woo -hoo. <clears throat> the more uh, critical the care is, usually the more uh, assessments are required throughout the day. Patients with focused symptoms uh, may require only parts of an examination. Uh, this, then they'll get a backup comprehensive assessment. But a lot of times whenever they have a focused uh, symptom or focused need, so to say, assessment, this is mostly ER. Right. People who come to the ER, the ED, if they come and say, I'm having the worst headache pain in my life, yeah, they don't listen to their Bible sounds. They're like, uh, they hit that pearl with the light, right? Can you follow my finger? Scale of one to ten, how bad's the pain? Where is it hurting? What started it? What makes it better? What makes it worse? You know, does the light bother you? Any nausea, vomiting, anything like that? Any sweating? Any any other symptoms along with this? No? Okay, you need a CP. Like they don't even care about your lung sounds. They don't even care if you have a heartbeat. Can you answer the question about a headache? Kidding. You know, but so those are uh, focus-driven assessments, and that's not what we're doing, but you'll learn that sometimes in nursing, that's all that you're going to do, right? If you're the PACU nurse, you're going to do a comprehensive assessment. If I'm the OR nurse, if I just go, you know, check the pulses in the extremity that we're operating on, make sure that all is well. So organizing is important. <clears throat> When we're uh, talking about the head to toe approach, you need to know that um, we assess for symmetry. It's hard for me to tell if something is abnormal if I only check one side, right? Mm -hmm. If I ask Mr. Hall to squeeze my hands, I'm going to ask him to squeeze both hands at the same time. If I ask him to push against my hands, I'm going to ask him to get both hands at the same time. That's the only way I can tell if his left hand her right hand is weaker than the other, right? If he pushes against this, and I'm like, all right, now push this, and I'm like, okay, they feel the same. Yeah, then maybe don't, right? And maybe that's not the case. So if we do things symmetrically. When you ask people to uh, raise their eyebrows, don't ask them to give you the student eyebrow, right? You want both of them at the same time. Some people are like, I can't do that. I just need you to try. Like, can you look surprised? Like somebody just sang you the hot dog song? Uh, right? Yeah. Can you smile for me? Don't smirk for me. Smile for me. You know, all this is, you know, a neuro assessment. We're trying to make sure that the nerves in their brain are communicating with the end of where they land in their face. So, 
Uh, offer rest period, periods as needed. That You wouldn't think that an assessment it would be exhausting, but it is to some people. Okay, rolling them back and forth. We want to make sure that we do it in a very organized manner. But if they need a break, then we'll usually go head to waist and then give them a break or head to heart and then give them a break wherever. But if they need a break, we'll give it to them. Be specific when you're recording your assessments. A lot of times in nursing, we record by exception. What was wrong? Why? So in the head to toe demo that I do for you, whoever decides to uh, be the patient that day, if there's anything abnormal, right? Those are the things that typically in nursing would show up to. Now, in acute care, our school has what's called a shift assessment. That is your head to toe comprehensive assessment. It covers every body system. Okay, it has me chart everything, whether it's exception or not, right? Lung sounds within normal limits. You know, you click a button and it, click clear and it just kind of grays everything else out. You know, is the chest rising symmetrical? Are there uh, any shortness of breath, any dyspnea on exertion, like all the things. So it depends on where you go, right? I'm gonna give you an example Thursday of documentation on head to toe assessment. What that would look like for you if you had to write it down. It's about that long. Mm. But you want to be specific. And record quick notes during the exams, be in your pocket. Mm. Things you put in your pocket. So how do we um, get our patient ready? We give them some privacy. Right? Now remember that's huge. Some privacy, make sure they're comfortable, understand their limitations. Give them that nice little gown and that paper sack, paper towel that they give us. And tell, anybody ever have to wear the paper towel? Mm. Y'all ain't ever had it? It's like this big. And it has armholes in it. I don't know why. So if, if you've never had that privilege, it'll happen to you one day and you'll remember this lecture. <laughs> you go to the doctor, sometimes they give you this paper gown. Um, tell you, you know, it's having a wait on the doctor to come you know, 10 years later after you're sweating behind your knees and all the things, and your paper towel gowns torn in half. They come in the room. <laughs> Ooh, I'm telling you, we only want to expose what's required. Okay, if I'm assessing you from the waist down, I'm not going to expose your breasts, I'm just not. It's not necessary. If I'm assessing your breast, if we're doing a breast examination, I'm not exposing your genitals. Don't snatch the covers off and leave them exposed to the colder weather. Okay, remember, if it were you lying up there, how would you want to be treated? You don't need to be looking at my genitals if you're doing a breast exam, weirdo. <laughs> right? What you mean? <laughs> no. Right? And a good patient will tell you that, but I mean, you know that culturally some people will just let you do it because they think you're a healthcare professional and you're going to do what's right. So know better. Expose what's necessary. When it comes to your older people, they don't tell you because they don't even call them. Mm -hmm. fuss about it. So we want to keep them comfortable. When they play at your healthcare provider's office, we want to give them a gown. It's just easier to navigate than clothes sometimes. Make sure the room's not too cold, right? Don't have to turn down on me longer. Position, like I said, I want to keep them comfortable. Make sure that they're not lying flat. Who can who cannot lie flat that you know? COPD? You look with any kind of shortness of breath, our heart failure patients. Right? How about big breasted women? Amen. Sometimes it's a struggle, right? We want to make sure they're comfortable and keep them safe. Use extra care when we're positioning older folks or people who have disabilities. You see that table right there on 30.2? You're going to want to remember those positions for your entire life. The uh, position, the area assessed, and the rationale most important. Okay? Remember that table. Talk to them about it. That's the whole psychological preparation. You know, you want to hear what I tell them? Here we go. Moses? Moses. Okay. That's what you get to lie Because I had it down last week. Then you lie. That's what happens in a relationship. Yeah. You got to stay honest. <clears throat> so, um, I'm going to give this quick. 
Hey, Miss Marcy, how are you? Doing good. My name's Felicia. I'm a nurse. So I'm going to perform a comprehensive assessment. Head to toe assessment is what it's called. It's going to require uh, that you put on a gown, and uh, I'm going to expose your body pretty much from head to toe. Okay, make sure you've got privacy numbers. Let me march in and out. But I'm going to look you over and just lean over real quick. Are you okay with that? So I'll tell you before I'm going to touch any of your areas that make you feel comfortable. But if you have that, you can always say that. And I'll just be extra clear. So now she's ready. She knows that she can tell me anytime I'm uncomfortable. I'm cold. Don't cover up my mirror. Right? All the things. She can have conversation with me. Psychological. First of all, I made eye contact with her. Love the therapeutic communication. Oh, there it is again. Right? I will also have that all the way in the model too. And seven. All right. When it comes to age groups, assessing infants is different, children different. That little dot right there that says treat adolescents as adults uh, and individuals because they tend to respond best when you treat them that way. But that is the truth. After talking with parents about digital information, you can speak along with adolescents. Not so with children and infants like the parent. We would just to be in the room unless we suspect abuse and everything we say. Call children by their first names. Right. Parents, Mr. and Mrs. Whole thing. When it comes to the older adults, we just want to be sensitive to what they are capable of. Do they have a caregiver? You know, what's important to them? That holistic care. Throughout the examination, we don't want to stereotype. All older people aren't hard of hearing. Right? All older people don't have vision problems. All older people don't even have vision There's a woman at Presbyterian home. If she's still there, she And two. She still got some on her off very on the Yes, ma'am. Don't even play about it. Should take it. Mm -hmm. We want to recognize that some older adults have some sensory limitations. Whenever we recognize that quickly. Remember in the exam you just took, it told you that the patient had thick glasses and hearing aids. Right? When you see that, it's okay. If they're turning and they're working, then we just want to acknowledge it. But if they have a sensory deficit, we want to make sure that we uh, compensate so they can understand them. Give them good space, keep them safe. That's the gist of it. So organizing things. Remember I told you during the demo that 80% of success in nursing beyond school is your setup. That's why I told you follow the sheet. So, page 553, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on the dots right there. I could highlight about every one of those. Can we pull it? Page 553, there's about five or six, seven dots right there in the line of fifth. Under organization? They're the only seven dots on the page on the right. Right? Oh, on the right. Yes, sir. I just finished talking about the age related groups. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> it's important to you to keep things organized. It's important to you to keep things, or keep things organized. I told you we do symmetry here, right? Ask the patient uh, how they're feeling. While you're looking, conversation always will be important to establish a report. If the patient is seriously ill, we first assess what? What's making them sick? Right? Remember that focus assessment? Briefly said it. There it is again. If the patient becomes fatigued, we let them rest. Mm -hmm. I want you to pay attention to the next sentence. What does it say? Say it again. Is that Palmer? Painful procedures near the end. Why? What's the why? To prevent further pain. Right. So we keep them from being uncomfortable the whole time and also from destroying rapport. Because I just came in and I was talking to Ms. Mose and I was so like a southern veil and I'm so hospital. The first thing I do is come in here and hurt her so I'm going to touch me. Right? Chances are, I won't get to finish my assessment if I hurt them to start with. Right? So if they say to you, uh, please don't whatever because that hurts, the statement is, um, so because I know that makes you uncomfortable, whenever it comes to that portion of the assessment, we'll do that last. 
And they're there for abdominal pain, but we know they don't have appendicitis or pancreatitis or gastroenteritis or some other itis. If we know that all those things have been ruled out, right, I'm not going to palpate their abdomen first. We've already had the assessment. We kind of know which direction we're headed. Right? That painful part is going to be last. That's what you would want. Right? Inspection, you know what that means? Look at it. There it is. I'm inspecting y'all all the time. Look at it. Inspection. It occurs when interacting with a patient, watching for verbal and nonverbal emotional statements that are made. We can assess a whole lot of things on inspection. Some dot, dot, dots right here for you, too. It's highlighted in my book. Make sure the lighting is good. Get your good old pin light. Right? Position well. Checking symmetry. There it is again. While we're assessing, we want to recognize the nature of and source of body odors. Doesn't matter. It does. A lot of times, um, unusual odor can indicate that there's some kind of infection going on. And the book calls it underlying pathology. Olfaction helps to detect abnormalities. You know what olfaction is? Smell. Yeah, that's your sniffer. Right. Yeah. Palpation. Lay your hands on me. Okay. I try. Palpation means I want to touch you. Okay. <clears throat> it happens head to toe, except for the genitals and such. And we touch them on a person, but you're not going to be touching these on your partner. And because you're going to do this head to toe assessment on a partner. Okay. Got it? Yep. You're going to do this head to toe assessment on a partner. You're going to touch them. You're going to ask them permission to touch them. But good news is that you don't have to put on the gown. Okay. Let's check off. And we're not going to look at each other's genitals. <laughs> or breasts, for that matter. <laughs> Just figure out to get rid of that anxiety. Y'all don't even think about it, so I said it. So then there's that. Palpating. <laughs> touching them. What are we touching? What do you think we're checking for? Yeah. My hands are capable of. Say it again. Skin turner. Skin. Skin turner, yes. What else? Palpate pulses. So we palpate pulses. We feel for pulsations. What else? Temperature of the skin. Any tenderness? Edema. Edema. Texture. Texture. We'll be touching the pressure. Don't do that. <laughs> We're going to let you, Mosley. You first one. Stage four. There you go. Don't, don't, don't. Lay your hands on. <laughs> Actually, most of the time when it comes to pressure ulcers, we don't wear our heads. It's because it's an infection control issue. You never know. Try to do that as sterile as possible. Um, so palpation, when we palpate, temperature. Temperature of the skin, is it hot, is it cold, right? Yeah. Moisture. Swelling. Tenderness. All that stuff matters to you. Okay? Palpate. We're going to palpate. We're going to start at the scalp, right? Tender palpation and deep palpation. There's two types, light and deep. Most of the time, deep palpations are uh, advanced practice nurses' palpations. You'll find this one. Anybody ever heard of rebound tenderness before? Mm -hmm. Do you know what it means? Exactly. So, what was my last name? Miss Kimes? You want to tell them? Tell them anyway. When you pull your hands off of the tender spot, that's where it starts hurting. So can you hear? You didn't hear, Miss Wynn? You want me to interpret? Don't be scared to teach. It'll be part of your job. <clears throat> so basically, rebound tenderness, if usually we see it with, do you know? Appendicitis? Yes. Appendicitis. Usually we see it with appendicitis. Basically, rebound tenderness, and when I push in, it doesn't hurt. When I let go, it hurts. Kind of like the rebound off of a basketball goal, right? It's not the fact that you hit the backboard that was bad. It's the fact that it didn't go into the bad. That's what hurts, right? Came back out. Whenever you release and you let it go. <clears throat> so palpation is big. Like I said, it'll start at the head. It's going to get to the toes. 
Top patient. Percussion involves tapping the skin with the fingertips to vibrate underlying tissues and organs. We do this to locate masses and things like that. A lot of times you'll see it done uh, over the abdomen more than anywhere. Uh, you can just hear a difference in the way things sound. Typically, we as registered nurses do not percuss. You know, we just, we just don't use it as an advanced practice nurse for the nurse that. But you'll see uh, percussion. Sometimes you will, maybe. A critical care nurses more so, but usually us med surge nurses, you know, we can, we know how, but we can tell when it sounds different. Like when somebody has a lot of uh, gas trapped in their stomach, you can put your hand on there and you can tap, and you are even on their skin directly, and you can hear it, it sounds like a melon, right? Just air, it's very tall. And then whenever they've had a bowel movement or they've passed gas, and you tap it again, it'll sound different, not as hollow, right? Auscultation, you know what that is? You listen, do you do that with your ears? Yeah, yeah. and what else? Stethoscope. Hey, your stethoscope. Please listen to people's heart sounds when you're stethoscope and not your ears. You're walking when you have your head on somebody's chest and you're feeling weird. That means don't show up about your equipment. Okay? Some sounds, such as speech, coughing, uh, these things can be heard without equipment, but internal sounds like air, uh, gastric sounds, the heart, uh, Heart, lungs, gastric sounds, and pulses even um, need to have that stethoscope to listen. We can palpate pulses, but if we're going to auscultate them, we need to have a stethoscope. Need to have a good stethoscope. The diaphragm and uh, the veil, right? Some folks have one that only has a veil. Those mean that they are lying on the weight of your hand to specify how they need to hear. So the veil is best, you remember this. Bell is best for hearing low pitch sounds like vascular and certain heart sounds. The diaphragm is best for listening to high pitch sounds like the vowel and lung sound. Frequency, number of times that we hear, that we hear the loudest, pretty self explanatory. The quality, what does it sound like? Blowing and gurgling, you'll hear us talk about brewies and nursing, and that's more that blowing sound that you'll hear over like uh, Ivy or dialysis port or dialysis accesses and things like that. Um, I want you to get your stethoscope out today when you get home and listen to your heart. If you got somebody who lives in the house with you, and they're willing, Listen to their heart, listen to their lungs, listen to their uh, bowel sounds and all four quads, like listen to their carotid pulses. Right? Just get a good listen, see what things are kind of starting to sound like. Uh, don't get out in front of Walmart and just start doing it to strangers. You won't get community service hours for that. Duration, how long does the song last? Song, sound lasts. It depends on how many people's birthday it is. General appearance. What they look like. General just appearance. I'm telling you, I have to take your stethoscope, which is really that box of fuel. What do they look like? What is their gender? What is their race? Right? A gender affects the type of examination performed uh, and the order of assessments, different physical features related to gender and race. Uh, certain illnesses are more likely to be specific to gender and race. We've talked about all these things before, the 